everyone. Happy Monday. I hope uh, you've had the chance to rest and rejuvenate over the spring break. And we are so delighted to have you join us uh, in this lunch hour for yet another uh, program uh, organized by the Madrasa Midrasha um, program here at the GTU. My name is Majibin Tala and I direct this wonderful program. And it is my pleasure to be uh, speaking at this program called uh, Preparing for Sacred Re uh, Seasons. And I am delighted to have Dr. Dina Aronoff uh, join us uh, in sharing the Jewish perspective on preparing for Passover. And um, Dina is um, someone who does not need an introduction, but she is faculty director of the Richard S. Dinner Center for Jewish Studies at the Graduate Theological Union here in Berkeley. And she teaches rabbinic literature, medieval patterns of Jewish thought, and the broader question of continuity and change in Jewish history. Her recent publications engage with the subject of childcare, maternity, and the making of Jewish culture. Welcome, Dina. So thrilled to have you. Thank you, Majabin. Um, it's really wonderful to be doing this event with you. Um, the Center for Islamic Studies and the Center for Jewish Studies have come together in this program, the Madrasa Midrasha program for over a decade. But it might be that this is our first time you and I jointly presenting. Um, I have to say hello to Munir Jiwa if he's listening um, on his sabbatical. Um, but there's uh, always a special kind of nourishment that I get from joining uh, our communities in exploring, in particular, the times when our sacred calendars sync up in very thought-provoking and even stirring ways. And I think this year is one of those years with uh, Ramadan on the horizon, so to speak, <laughs> uh, along with Passover. So I'm really excited for this conversation. And it's my honor also to tell those of you who don't yet know Majabin, uh, Majabin Dalla is the director of the Madrasa Midrasha program here at the GTU, as well as an assistant professor in Islamic studies. Her interdisciplinary research integrates classical theological Islamic texts, along with a kaleidoscope of modern feminist theories. And in that integration, Majabin confronts and contributes to the ra rapidly developing discourse between faith and feminism. And uh, uh, Majabin's work in general focuses on exploring constructive methodologies that contribute to um, kind of dialogue between critical uh, inquiry in the study of religion and also spiritual um, and uh, traditional engagement with religion. Um, so in many ways, Majabin, I think, breaks out of some of the binaries that structure um, academic work in our fields. Very exciting. Um, so what I will do now is introduce Majabin's talk today. Uh, she'll begin our program, uh, and then I'll have something to say. And then, as always, we'll leave plenty of time for conversation. Uh, if I may invite folks, uh, we have a Q&A uh, option at the bottom of your screen where you can post questions and towards the end of our hour together is when we'll do our best to curate those questions and engage with them. We're really looking forward to hearing from you. Um, and uh, Dr. Dalla's talk today is called Planning a Sacred Makeover, uh, in which she will reflect on the different ways in which Muslims prepare their hearts, minds, and material possessions to enter the month of Ramadan with the intention of manifesting positive changes for themselves and their communities. Majabin, uh, please. Thanks, Dina. Uh, and thank you for pointing out that this might very well be the first time we're actually in, in, a, in, a, in an event together. So uh, this is really exciting. And thank you for reminding us that there is a Q&A function here and you're welcome to drop in questions there. Uh, I also want to extend a thank you to the Walter and Elise Haas Fund that makes these programmings possible for us and to thank Matt, who's always there in the back, you know, to, to make sure that this is running smoothly. Uh, as we start off, um, I want to invite uh, our attendees and thank you for being here 
this afternoon uh, to maybe drop in something that they're preparing to celebrate. Um, well, I'll be talking about the Muslim uh, sacred season of Ramadan, which is on the horizon. And Dina will be sharing, of course, the Passover and preparations for the Passover. So if there are folks in our, um, in our attendance today who want to share something else that uh, other groups might be preparing for, which is considered as a sacred time in their traditions, then please put that in the chat so we can have a collective celebration and at least a naming of all these beautiful seasons and sacred moments uh, in our traditions. So I wanna start off with um, Ramavan Karim. And um, it's right around the corner, maybe in a week from now. And um, there are mixed feelings, you know, when, when Ramadan is around the corner, because there are so many levels of preparations that take place for Muslims. I'm going to share sp four specific points within the time that I have. One is, of course, the spiritual and the sacred part of it, where um, Muslims are preparing their souls and their hearts to receive that compassion and that mercy and to be able to become conductors which can translate that compassion and mercy that extends not just to their own selves but also to their families and their communities at large. So there is this very important component connected to the sacred season of Ramadan which involves the spirituality of people. But I also want to take a moment and talk about bodies because biological clocks, bodies are also very involved in, in the month of Ramadan. And then I also want to take a moment and talk about the financial assets that Muslims have and how this time becomes a time of checks and balances, even when it comes to money and material possessions. And then sadly enough, there is a fourth component and that is the component of security. And I know that this may be something that people don't wanna think about as they're preparing for the sacred seasons, but there are many Muslim communities and Muslim minorities in the world that are not just thinking of spirituality and bodies and money, but they're also thinking about safety and security of their congregations and their communities in this time. So I'm gonna start off with, uh, with the spirituality and uh, the two months that precede the month of Ramadan. So we are now in the Islamic lunar month, which is known as Sha'ban. And before that was the month of uh, Ramadan. Uh, sorry, it was the month of Rajab. Now, the spiritualists tell us that Rajab and Sha'ban together prepare us for the month of Ramadan. Uh, there is a prophetic tradition that says that Rajab involves a kind of spiritual spring cleaning where the most spiritually beneficial act is the act of repentance and seeking forgiveness. So it's, it's a time where Muslims will, will focus on revisiting mistakes, revisiting slips, and seek forgiveness from God from that. So Rajab is focused on forgiveness, asking for forgiveness personally with God, and then asking for forgiveness from one another, you know, asking folks to forgive us and, and also responding with forgiveness to others. Shaban then becomes a month of decorating the soul. So it's just like how you would clean out a wardrobe. You take out everything that is a burden in your wardrobe. And then you'd get something maybe nice you know, and festive to embellish it. So Shaban then is an embellishment, a spiritual embellishment. And, and the most spiritually beneficial act in the month of Shaban is to send benedictions and blessings on Muhammad and the family of Muhammad. And, and this becomes a way of embellishing the soul. And together, Rajab and Shaban prepare the Muslim to then become a guest of the month of God. So Ramadan is the month of God where the host is God and all those who will be observing the fast and who will be partaking in, in that spiritual growth will be the guests on the mantle laid down by God. So uh, to, be, to be eligible for that, uh, for being a guest in the month of God, you would start with this self-purification and this embellishing with the connection to the prophet and sending benedictions on him and his family. And then the month itself is 
um, sort of focuses on embodying empathy because fasting is a way of embodying empathy. There is, we hear about people who are not able to get a square meal a day. We hear about people who are deprived of the basic needs of human existence. There is one thing hearing about that, watching it on TV, reading it in the newspaper, and it's a totally different experience actually staying hungry for 18 to 20 hours a day. And, and when one feels those pangs of hunger and those, uh, the parchment, you know, the parchness of the th th throat, that's where you actually embody that empathy. And you realize that, you know, for me, there is a time for breaking the fast. There is an iftar meal and a celebration prepared. But for so many in the world, their, their days don't end with that kind of a celebratory meal. So, you know, day in and day out for 30 days, 29 days, this is a way of registering the pain of human beings who are deprived in the world and, and a way of embodying that empathy for themselves. Um, of course, you know, taking this a, a level deeper, there are traditions of the prophet that says there are people who will fast where only their bodies are refraining from food and water and other things that Muslims will refrain from, from the time of dawn to dusk in respecting the spiritual season. But then there are those whose thoughts will also be fasting, as in they will be guarding uh, the emotions of the heart and the thoughts of the mind. So they will be guarding their hearts and their minds from going astray. And there will be those who are even better than all of this, and they will be aiming at initiating and sustaining positive change in their lives and their communities. So they will actually be using the 29 to 30 days of the month of fasting to make positive resolutions and to say, as the crescent dissipates and the new moon rises, I will be a new person with new engagements and with a new take on life. And I will try to do this not just personally, but I will move forward with my family and with my community to a better future. So these are all the different ways in which that's, that spirituality will be sparked off for Muslims in the month of Ramadan. Of course, it will be also a moment to embody compassion and mercy because there are so many traditions that say that even breathing this month is, is is, uh, is considered as um, a chanting of the names of God or a remembrance of the names of God. So just breathing as fasting is also of spiritual merit. To take a nap in the day is also like offering prayer. To be kind to those who are working for you in this, in this time is actually invoking empathy and mercy from God for for, for things to become easier in our lives. So it's, it's sort of integrating the self, the community, and being mindful of physical exertion on everyone's part. Um, the family members, the elders, the young ones who will be fasting. And also if people are in charge of commu you know, communities or um, business corporations to, be, to lighten the load of others during this month. So there's, there's a whole lot that is happening spiritually there. But I wanna transition not to bodies, and when you're thinking of bodies, you're thinking of food. And it, I want to say that Ramadan is as much about preparing for food as much as it is for restraining from eating and drinking. So households will be in this festive mode even before the dawn of Ramadan, where there will be these extensive grocery shopping lists. There will be these extensive menus prepared. Uh, inviting folks over to the house so that they can break bread together. Uh, community is getting together in congregations at the Islamic centers and other places where they can break bread together as communities. Interfaith iftar is happening a lot in, in America. So not just Muslim communities, but communities from other faith getting together to celebrate this moment of iftar. So there's a whole lot of uh, you know, food and food preparation that is involved as well. But when I'm talking about bodies, I also want to talk about the biological clocks. So uh, Muslims will be waking up at maybe 4 a.m. in the morning, if not earlier, 
to get a snack, to prepare themselves for maybe 12 hours, 15 hours of fasting. And it's, it's going to disrupt the biological clock because some of us won't be able to go back to sleep to be able to get up again for 7 a.m. to go back to work. Uh, some people will you know, double up on their coffee and caffeine intake at 4 a.m. so that they can keep running till 4 p.m. and then just crash then for a few hours before sunset so that they can, they can wake up and then participate in, in the iftar. So it, it's, it's really about you know, fixing that biological clock as well, which makes people stressed out, nervous right before uh, the month of Ramadan. So that's the reality of it as well. Uh, the other thing that Muslims will do is try to get their finances in, in checks and balances before the dawn of Ramadan, because the, the zakat, which is a very, uh, which is one of the key tenets of Islamic uh, practice, uh, the annual charity will be calculated in the month of Ramadan, and most Muslims will be ready to sort of pay off that charity in this month. So while they're thinking about spirituality and they're thinking about bodies, they're also stock taking on, on the wealth that they've amassed in the year and try to work out how much charity they'll be paying. Um, and then there will be this mandatory charity on the day of Eid, which will be the the last day of the month of Ramadan and uh, the morning of the day of Eid, where there will be each family will pay an equivalent of seven pounds of staple food to a family in need. And they will pay on behalf of every member of their family. So if there was a family of four, they will calculate for four people, seven pounds each, roughly three kilograms of staple food each, and then calculate that in terms of money, because most of the time this will go to countries outside the US to help people uh, ward off poverty. And uh, it, will be, it will be actually due and paid before they, they have their own celebratory meal on Eid day. So again, it's, a, it's, it's being mindful of social justice. So you're first offering this to those who are deprived before celebrating yourself. And I wanna end with the fourth uh, point, which I talked about. And sadly, um, this is preparing for the security of the congregants. I have grown up, traveled to, you know, participated with Ram in Ramadan activities over countries where communities are not just preparing for food and the carpet and, and things like that, they're also placing metal detectors in front of their mosques because they've received threats that there will be bomb attacks, there will be people who want to disturb the peace of those who are observing the month. So this is again a reality, preparing for the security of those who will congregate. Uh, countries like Pakistan, countries in the Middle East, uh, it, is, it is not uncommon to walk through a metal detector before you actually enter a mosque to be able to offer your prayers. And this is not just happening, you know, somewhere globally outside the US. I was just catching up on the news this weekend and Friday, March the 25th, uh, there was a, uh, an FBI raid that caught this person who had hired two teenagers to bomb a mosque, a Shia mosque in Maine and probably a synagogue as well and was going to put this on ISIS. So this is happening right here in our country where we live as Muslims are preparing for the month of Ramadan. And another incident was of a person who walked in with a propane tank in the Shia mosque in, in Florida, about to blow up all the kids who had gathered there to prepare for the Ramadan. Uh, but he was intercepted by the, the guard and the guard died in that interception. The person was shot by the police authorities, but is recovering uh, in hospital. But sadly, this is also another aspect of preparing uh, for certain minorities. And uh, we wish that we can move forward and, and participate and contribute towards a world where everyone's world fits and where everyone feels comfortable associating with what they consider sacred and how they prepare for that sacred season. So thank you so much for listening to me. Um, and I welcome your uh, questions maybe a little later. Uh, 
Um, but I will, but I ask you again to keep sending your, um, you know, the, the, the sacred seasons that you're preparing to uh, celebrate in this time in the chat. Um, and as you're doing that, you'll, you'll also help me welcome uh, Dina uh, to, to share something about preparing for the sacred time of Passover in the Jewish tradition. Welcome, Dina. Thank you, Madrabeen. Um, that's a, you just gave us a lot to think about, and I was taking furious notes um, because the concepts that you just shared just were very powerful. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to turn now to my presentation and I'm just going to pull it up. Um, so I am very excited at the possibility of talking about preparation. Um, the reason why I like talking about preparation is because I think it inevitably shifts the lens of focus from the more uh, obvious peak ceremonial aspects of sacred time in towards some of the more neglected phases, that there's something about talking about preparation that takes us towards the margins of common understandings of religious life. And as some of you know, I, I love to live in the margins and um, to bring that activity towards the center. So I think the whole topic today of preparation does that just by definition. And so what I wanted to talk about today are three aspects of preparation that I, I like to think about with regard to Jewish culture, but hopefully more broadly. Um, a temporal aspect, uh, a spatial aspect, and then also spiritual. So as I just mentioned a minute ago, when you think about preparation, there's a temporal aspect, the time before the peak visible ritual moment and how rewarding it can be to go to that time before. And there's also very strong feminist potential, I think, in directing our attention there. In as much as often peak ceremonial activity can be gendered male, this is true in Jewish culture, that when one includes the phase of preparation, temporarily speaking, beforehand, the effect is often to diversify the, the people involved. So that's, I wanna talk a little bit about the temporal aspect when you think about the time before and how that also opens up who is involved. And then the, Second aspect, the spatial aspect, which is that often when one thinks about the time before a peak ceremony, um, there's a shift in terms of which sacred spaces are included. And Majabina, I'm already thinking about your talk, grocery lists, like you brought us into the grocery store. That's not always where one goes when one thinks of Ramadan. So you're, uh, you took us into when someone who drinks coffee might have their coffee. So you brought us into their kitchen. So you, the, there's a, the, a diversification of sacred space that happens, I think, when we talk about preparation, although you were talking about, of course, elements of the Ramadan observances themselves. Uh, but often it takes us into everyday contexts, household behaviors, kitchen, in the case of Passover, we'll get to in a moment, cleaning, food preparation, hosting meals. Uh, Madhavin, you talked about God as the host of Ramadan. So in that sense, it comes full circle, bringing us into the household, but then taking the beautiful image of the household as a way to understand our relationship to the divine itself. So we don't stay there, it comes back. Um, and then the third aspect of spiritual, spiritual aspect, and I have to say, I know it's an overused phrase, especially in the Bay Area, but you know, you hear people say, it's the journey, it's not the destination. And I think that the moment one orients towards preparation towards a sacred uh, ceremony, it creates a little bit of a shift in the perspective where it's a, a little bit more about a kind of inner work in the everyday moment, um, as opposed to just kind of skipping over the, that in anticipation of the big 
event. So it becomes about the journey. And I might say a little bit about that, but maybe we'll hear more. Uh, there are so many great people in the Zoom room right now. So maybe people have thoughts uh, that they might wanna throw into the chat or in the Q&A. So in the few minutes that remain for me, I just wanted to develop a little bit more the uh, three aspects of preparation that I mentioned, the temporal aspect, the spatial aspect, and the spiritual one. And the temporal aspect, just a simple point, but yes, that sacred seasons begin before the peak kind of symbolic uh, ceremony in all kinds of activities. Um, in the, uh, now I'll just get a little more specific uh, since I'm here a little bit to kind of fill in what preparation looks like in uh, Jewish life, at least, you know, some segment of Jewish life. And that's just to say, I'll just start with Shabbat, with uh, Friday night and Saturday, that 24 hours of Shabbat is, I don't know, I almost want to say it's the pulse of the Jewish tradition. Um, but it doesn't begin with the peak ceremony, let's say, of blessing the wine or even chanting certain prayers. It really begins with a lot of preparation leading up to it. So the hustle and bustle of Friday uh, and in getting the community or even the individual equipped to observe the Sabbath is as central in many ways in Sabbath observance then the refraining that takes place on the Sabbath itself and the celebrations of the Sabbath itself. I always say, for example, some of you might be familiar with the fact that one of the ways that Shabbat is ushered in by a community, by a household, is by lighting candles. Famous, iconic image of lighting Sabbath candles. In all likelihood, this is uh, I just present this to you for consideration. Lighting Shabbat candles on Friday Eve at dusk, which you evoked, Majabin, in terms of an imp uh, important ritual time for Ramadan, lighting those candles in all likelihood began uh, in order to facilitate the activity that happened after nightfall. And since you couldn't strike a match or kindle a flame on the Sabbath itself, before it started, you lit candles. So it was a very mundane act of preparation, to use our term today, to enable the celebrations and the meals that were coming. As many of you know, that act of preparation, in a way, a kind of household matter, took on ceremonial significance so that in many ways, it's probably the most prominent iconic symbol of the Sabbath with its roots in a, the very mundane steps taken uh, to enable just basic household life after nightfall. So that's just an example of how ceremony and sacred time is not restricted to what often passes as the peak central piece, but that there's phase of preparation that's in a way that's just as constitutive of religious life. I'll give one more example of this. This is something I'm working on right now um, in a book I'm doing my best to put together. Um, some of you may know there's a very important chapter in Jewish history where the Jews in the Iberian Peninsula in the late medieval period were forcibly converted to Christianity, both in what were the kingdoms of Spain and then Portugal. And uh, a few generations into those forced conversions, um, church uh, inquisitional tribunals were set up to um, persecute families and individuals that despite having been baptized, continued to carry on a kind of Jewish life. Um, and those people who baptized but carried on with their Jewish life are often called conversos, so people with a conversion in their history uh, or in their person, but who at least by the standards of the church persisted in Jewish behaviors. And there's one behavior that appears again and again in uh, polemics against the persistent Jewish behaviors of the conversos. And that was this very strange habit of converso uh, people to sweep their homes inward, indoors. Varera casa as avesas. They would sweep the house 
inside, which is a very strange thing to do, even today somewhat, but certainly when you had dust floors and dirt floors, when you swept them, you swept outside. What a strange practice to sweep towards the inside of your house. It's not even, it's not good hygiene. <laughs> Um, so for generations, hundreds of years, this was just treated as a very mysterious, but distinctively, what to call it, we could call it Jewish, or we could call it Marano, or we could call it Converso activity. Well, in the 1700s, there was a rabbinic authority who decided to explore the roots of this behavior and determined that actually it was in observance of the fact that the Jewish household is marked by the mezuzah, uh, the kind of placing of a sacred biblical text on the threshold at the entrance to the house. So because the threshold is a sacred place, housing a sacred text, it was not respectful to kind of sweep in that direction. And so the kind of pious urge brought such families to be sweeping inward. And uh, Yosef Yerushalmi, who was my teacher and a scholar of these materials, was very pleased to find this proof text to finally explain this very puzzling action. And what I want to propose to today is that it is a wonderful linkage that's made between the custom of Varera Casa Asavesas with the mezuzah at the threshold. But that comes hundreds of years later and is a rabbinic attempt to integrate a household custom into, again, a ceremony of even higher register and of greater vintage, which is the mezuzah. But what I wouldn't want to lose is the likelihood, in my, in my opinion, that the reason that a custom of sweeping indoors developed is because, well, let me put it this way, the reason they were sweeping in the wrong way is because they were sweeping on the wrong day. So the, sadly, and we know this from the inquisitional records, if a household was engaging in major household cleaning on a Friday, for example, that was a telltale signal of a kind of Judaizing bent. Um, Saturday was the day for household work, uh, marketing, uh, spinning. Um, and so you think it's only incriminating to do, I don't know, these significant uh, events, let's, uh, excuse me, actions like lighting candles, but it turns out when you sweep is also an act that in this case tragically can get you in big trouble. Um, but I, I guess if I could just take a more positive spin on it, it just shows that everyday life is a big part of religious culture. And to narrow the frame to include only certain, let's call it kind of public activity, um, is to lose out on what are maybe equally important uh, phases of religious activity. Um, so I guess I'll say one uh, more comment about spatial preparation and then um, oh, can't wait to open this up. As I mentioned, when we shift our focus to preparation for a sacred time, what becomes visible is first of all, all kinds of activities that happen before the peak event. Um, but what also tends to happen is that it broadens the spaces and contexts where the activity of religion takes place. So religion doesn't just happen in these peak uh, uh, kind of rarefied religious spaces, but happens as a part of everyday life. And for this kind of thinking about religion, I draw heavily from Talal Assad's thinking about religion and his attempt to free it up from the very restrictive terms of um, largely, let's say, Protestant European definitions of religious life in which it focuses primarily on a kind of, let's say, spiritual, theological, and doctrinal adherence and tends to leave out or maybe even sometimes demote the kinds of trappings of religion that are thought of as mostly kind of habits, they're coercive, um, and in a way religiously meaningless, that religiously meaningful activity is activity of the mind, of the spirit, and less so of the body. Well, Talal Asad comes along to talk about religion as something 
much broader than uh, doctrinal adherence, but actually something by means of which a person develops, and here's a quote from a lecture he gave at UC Berkeley years ago, by means of which a person develops an aptness of behavior, sensibility, and attitude, end quote, um, that contributes not only to the formation of the person, but also of the collective. So ritual life is part of the formation of the person and also of their social relationships. And I like to take Assad's estimation of religion and bring it, I think, to a, its most natural conclusion, which is namely that the primary site for this cultivation of what he calls an aptness of behavior is the household, is the context of family relations. And I would say the primary procedure for the formation of those sensibilities is the procedure of child rearing. So family relations are the most potent factors in forging the sensibilities to which Assad refers and the household is the context where that tends to happen. And Passover is a fantastic example, I think, of a household-based ritual. The peak ritual in the case of Passover is in the context of the household. Um, and does a lot of work in shaping the sensibilities of its participants in, in very culturally specific ways. Um, and so I'll just end there uh, in the hopes that perhaps that third category about spiritual preparation can maybe emerge in conversation uh, bet uh, between Majabin and I, and of course, with all of you here. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dina. And, and thank you for everyone who's shared their sacred seasons here in the chat. So we are uh, sharing blessings and we're sharing good thoughts for all those who are in the middle of Lent. Um, and um, I think we have, um, I don't want to miss it. Yeah, here we have uh, the first day of Ridwan, which is a, a Baha'i celebration. So blessings out for that community as well. And if you still want to keep you know, adding to that, please go ahead and um, share your sacred seasons with us here in the chat as well. Um, Dina, do you wanna say a little bit about the, the spirituality? I mean, you, you just you know, left that part. So maybe something to get us started off and you know, spark a conversation from that aspect. Well, let me bring this to you, Majavi, and I'll just share with you. So last Saturday, Shabbat in synagogue, we announced the new moon of Nisan. That's the Hebrew name for the month that pa of Passover, which biblically speaking is named as the first month because the biblical imagination of the year is the springtime as the first month. Um, but later on in Jewish history, it took on the name Nisan, a Babylonian name. Um, but we announced the new month to start this coming Saturday. And I definitely had this moment with thanks to our community here at the Graduate Theological Union, where I was thinking, oh, it's the new month also of Ramadan. And um, the prayers in synagogue that are said when we announce the new month and the new moon are for that there should be mercy and wellness and sustenance and peace. And um, I had it in my heart to think of our communities and more broadly our global kind of humanity and the crisis that we're in, mm -hmm. in general. Um, so, so I don't know, spiritually preparation also calls up the kind of anticipation um, I wonder if you have thoughts on anticipation and its place in spiritual life. Mm. Yeah, that, that, that's a beautiful point, but I want to sort of um, go off on another tangent, if I might, uh, and, and pick up another word that you shared with us, uh, Dina. And, and while we're doing this, please feel free to drop any questions that might emerge for you in the Q&A, um, and, and we'll take it up from there. But um, I, I, I think you shared something about a gendered or a feminist aspect in, in the preparing for the Passover. And for a moment when you shared that term, I was transported at a point, which is, you know, way before my birth, but like half a century ago, 
um, which I was told while I was studying within my own community, you know, trying, trying to see how gender roles emerged, you know, construed or wrongly construed, and how certain aspects of preparing for a, for a sacred season were, I want to say, imposed on, on, on one group of the community while the other community got a chance or the other group got a chance to bask in the spirituality of that season. So uh, I'm referring to, uh, well, the role of preparing the grocery list, going out shopping, making sure there's enough meat and goodies in the house to prepare the meals, almost just fell on the women uh, in the community. Uh, to a point that growing up, I saw the women in my family dropping from the exhaustion of having to clean, cook, having everything ready for the family for iftar time. Um, and while I saw the men folk, you know, just, just before iftar time, uh, getting into their new clothes, wearing, you know, their perfume, heading out to the mosques to be able to participate in congregational prayers and, you know, meeting the community while the women were just too burned out. And they were like, just give me my coffee and let me just, you know, sit down for the rest of the evening. Uh, and would miss out on so many things that happen post uh, dawn, you know, the things that happen in the night, things that the special prayer ceremonies because they're just so tired. And, and then I remember being a part of a community where the, the board members got together and they said, how about if we prepare meals, family meals for all the community? So the community contributed and instead of breaking fast at home, People took turns to prepare meals in the community. That way, the entire family would come to the, to the mosque. The women, the children, and the men. The women would get a chance to be in congregational prayer. Sit down, have maybe a modest meal, not as elaborate as they would have prepared for, for the home. And then stay back in the mosque to participate in the other prayers and the other spiritual uh, rituals that, that take place in the nights in the mosque. So I... I um, at, at one part, of course, I saw that, uh, that beautiful work and compassion that, that the mothers were putting in to prepare uh, and to facilitate their families participating in the month of Ramadan. But at the same time, I saw them missing out on that entire spiritual uh, experience because of that physical exhaustion. So um, I think at least in America or in the United States now, uh, people are embracing this new modality of where the family just gets up and goes to the mosque, participates in a simple iftar, but is able to also then contribute and participate in the spiritual rituals that take place. So uh, when you were talking about that, I mean, I, I could appreciate, yes, all the lovely food and, and things like that, but um, that disparity also sort of, you know, resonated with me. And, and I was thinking of that. So I think anticipating for for better, more inclusive modalities um, as we prepare for our sacred seasons. Yeah, I'm gonna stop there. Thank you, Majabeen. And I'll share that wonderful comments and sharings and questions are happening in the chat. Um, but I'm, I'm having a madrasa midrasha moment, Majabeen, where you're narrating a gender dynamic in, um, you know, certain uh, Muslim communities and the parallel to the situation in certain Jewish communities is complete. I don't think there's any detail that you shared that doesn't have a kind of very strong parallel in traditional Jewish communities. And then you also outlined a potential solution, which I think somebody liked in the chat uh, in response to what you were saying. And if I could just pick up on that, because we don't have, you know, tons of time to say that what you're alluding to is the way that the mosque and the, the shul or the synagogue can further, it does this already, take on what I could think of as household and family functions to enable more robust participation of, of all genders and, and, and gendered tasks. So this, is, this isn't hard for the synagogue to do, and I would love to hear more if we choose to keep talking on this topic, to hear about how it happens at a mosque even, mosque even further. Um, but synagogues that provide childcare during prayer times, synagogues that provide meals 
in order to achieve exactly what you're talking about, more robust participation, especially from women in the community who would otherwise have to perform those tasks in the household context. So the synagogue, I often like to think of the synagogue as a kind of collective of households. Um, and I think that's an important corrective because sometimes when people think of a synagogue, they think of it as the corresponding institution, I don't know, church, synagogue, mosque, uh, temple. Um, in fact, it's often called a temple as opposed to synagogue or in the Ashkenazic world, shul, in the Hebrew, Beit Knesset, there's um, different terminology for the place. But the place is sometimes, I think, mistakenly understood to be the rarefied place of prayer, almost having a monastic quality. But then when you go into a synagogue, especially the more traditional the synagogue, the more this will be the case, you walk in and there's even like a surprise. Uh, Francesco Spagnolo over at UC Berkeley talks a lot about the aesthetics of synagogue life and the way in which sometimes the architecture is pastiche, the music is a mix, there's kids, there's talking, the, the whole norm of decorum seems absent. And all of this to come back, Madrabin, to your insight, it's only absent if one is expecting a certain kind of uh, environment. But if the synagogue is actually a collective of households coming together, yes, for prayer, but also maybe to satisfy needs that we're used to thinking of as needs that are satisfied in the household context, but actually they're satisfied here too. Body needs, social needs. I mean, synagogues used to be the place where guests would stay overnight if they're coming through town, sleeping. Um, so the synagogue is not outside of all these uh, dimensions of human experience. And it can rise to the occasion, therefore, in the ways you describe, to level out uh, and be more inclusive of who's participating. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And I think we have a question that just sort of dovetails from what we're, what we're talking about right now. But I also want to recognize that at some point we need to pivot back to what Dr. Shahabuddin uh, has asked about, you know, a question about personal introspection. So just because we're, we're talking about this, maybe we can uh, take Peggy's note here that, that she said that, you know, how do both traditions respond to the unique needs of pregnant, birthing, and nursing women? So, um, and I'm happy to start us off, you know, talking about that and um, resonating very much with what you shared uh, as one of the roles, the communal or social roles that a synagogue might play. And I think that the mosque for the for Muslim life has played, you know, that kind of a role uh, to to an extent where you have. Uh, you know, prophetic traditions where he would encourage people to stand up after a Friday sermon and talk about a need that they had. So if somebody had girls or boys of marriageable age, they it would be very normal for a person to stand up and say, these are, you know, this is what I'm looking for. Are there parties who have the same needs? And that would become a place of networking. Or there could be a traveler who just walked in and said, hey, I'm visiting this part of town and I need a place to stay. Or this, these are my, you know, prospects and business. Is, are there people that I can network with? And it would be very normal for that kind of a conversation to take place, not just in that specific sacred space, but also in that sacred time, which is the time of Juma, and, and it would be perfectly normal. And in fact, there have been ways in which some spiritualists have spoken about Juma as a weekly social gathering or a community networking for people to, to come together. And uh, fast forward to, you know, Muslims here in the United States and most Islamic centers are functioning as that kind of a space. So absolutely, um, uh, there is room for, you know, especially responding to this question here, for mothers who are nursing, for mothers who are pregnant, there's places where, uh, you know, curtains are drawn, where there is a feminine space, where women can just have their own space, where they are stretching out and they're doing that in a modest space so that they don't have the gaze from the men and uh, breastfeeding if they need to, uh, a place for toddlers where they can um, make as much noise as they want, a few volunteers from among the community that are engaging those who can, who can paint, draw, the storytelling. So there's something happening there with that age group as well. And um, opening up the space for including uh, everybody at every stage of their journey. So um, absolutely, that's, that's the kind of function that, that you see that Islamic centers and mosques are, 
are playing um, and, and are meant to play, so to speak, uh, in Muslim life. Uh, did you want to add something there, Dina, before we pivot to? Um... Let's pivot. What an important uh, question and insight there. What about introspection? I think, Fajr, I you touched, you really treated that because when you were talking about these months leading up to Ramadan and um, the self-purification and embellishment and the embodiment of empathy that is what it is to be in Ramadan, uh, do you have more thoughts on the place of introspection for sacred seasons? Yeah, so um, um, I'm wondering, uh, Dr. Shabuddin, I don't know, perhaps, um, you know, there'll, there'll be a recording and if you missed the, the beginning part, then you can absolutely refresh uh, and, and get that part. But it is truly uh, a place for personal introspection. In fact, um, I want to say that most Islamic rituals um, are geared towards that introspection. Even if you think about the five daily prayers, um, and I'll be talking more. I don't want to add a plug here. Maybe, all right, I am adding a plug here for, for our talk tomorrow, which is a GTU live, uh, GTUX live event. Uh, and we'll talk about this journeying in place. And uh, the five daily prayers are also a place of introspection, of, uh, of looking at the several stages the, the bodily stages, you know, the standing tall, the bowing down, the going into prostration. And even I want to say before that, and that is the ablution, to look at the clear water. You know, there, there are things that Muslims will do where they'll hold the water in their palms and, you know, gargle with it or, and, and then just look at it as they're putting it over their faces, is the transparency of the water that invites the individual to be that transparent core, you know. Um, and, and not be dual in what they believe, how they act, what they want for themselves, what they want for their community, what they want for the larger human uh, society, that, that clarity, that purification. Um, and I want to say Ramadan also you know, has that, that invitation for um, personal introspection. And Dina, you pointed out Rajab was for you know, that kind of spring cleaning for unburdening um, confessions and forgiveness. And Sha'ban was a celebration and embellishing of the, of the spirit to be able to be eligible, to be a host, uh, a guest of God as the host of this month. So um, absolutely, I, I want to just, you know, not go on and on uh, saying those things, but absolutely there is that place for personal introspection. Yeah. And if I could just uh, build on this, the metaphor of guest and household that seems at least in part is one way that Ramadan is envisioned um, is suggestive, I think, of the importance of those very concrete experiences, um, which sometimes only become visible as metaphor in relation to God. And I guess I would say I'm finding myself, I'm at a point in my life where what I'm doing is actually going to those concrete references and raising them up. Um, it might, maybe I'm in a reactionary formation that will loosen up over time. Um, but in response to, and my, my chat moved a little bit, the question of what about, you know, personal uh, introspection and the more spiritual growth and I, I think I'm in a phase in my intellectual life, social life, and religious life where I'm kind of doing the work to raise up activity that tends not to be emphasized in accounts of religious life, mm -hmm. and especially child rearing, um, especially the activities of the household, and especially what is sometimes referred to as habit. Habit is the bad thing because aware activity and introspection is the good thing in, in, in a crude binary. Um, and I, I'm stuck right now on making the point that our habitual action might be far more important and is cultivated through regularized, ritualized activity, sometimes that has high religious register, but sometimes it doesn't. The conditioning of Ramadan 
ideally creates a habitual orientation towards other people that happens unthinkingly. Like the Torah says, you know, if someone has, you know, needs uh, sustenance and support, don't withhold your hand, open and open your hand. So the hope is that every time you're in a public space and you're asked for something, the, the duty is to give no matter what, something. And that's meant to become a habit. Mm -hmm. So I'm become this, like, what's it call it? Like a, a speaker on behalf of habit also because I think that what often mothers or whoever is charged with the task of raising a small child, they're cultivating what could often be called habits of movement, even just how a person walks, their affect, their posture for better and for worse. So much of that is transmitted to the child just by observing the adults in the child's environment. It's a very daunting thing to think about. Uh, I'm not against awareness in movement. And some of you know, I'm very interested in the theories of Moshe Feldenkrais and the important intervention that awareness can make in breaking the habits that don't serve us. But I never want that to happen at the expense of elevating the culture that is nevertheless necessary to enable collective activity of great importance. So for now, I am devoting myself to these domains of the household. And Majabin, it's in conversation with you that I'm reminded, but wait a second, what about getting to go into the more rarefied prayer spaces and to have that experience to put on the perfume and a new garment and to experience oneself as a guest in the household of God. And um, I hope I swing back to that too, because I've, I've lost sight of that in many ways. Yeah. I mean, that's so important that you're naming that, you know, uh, that dilemma, you know, of, of um, naming something as a habit and, and something as a ritual, but then, I, I wonder if there is a way to reconcile that because rituals are also habituating in nature. And, uh, and I think as mothers or as, as leaders of households or you know, those who prepare the generations, they're actually preparing through habituation a, an, an aperture for the individuals to then invoke their own spiritual calling. So it, it's, it's through this habituating that, that there is this inlet into growing that habit into a sort of a religious ritual, if that is what the individual chose to do with their, you know, themselves. But for a moment, I also want to swing back and talk about spiritual growth um, and, and maybe allude to this one verse of the Quran, which, is, which resonates so often as the month of Ramadan begins and almost every lecture, almost every Friday uh, sermon will remind the practitioners that God has written down, Kutiba alaykum as you know, the, the, the Quran says, fasting has been written down for you. And then there is this, this intentionality for it. Why has this been written down for the practitioners? And the intentionality there in that verse is, so that you might attain piety. So there is a lot about the month of fasting that has to do with developing a sense of piety. Now, again, I, as I'm saying this word, as I'm naming piety, I am conscious of all the different ways in which people understand piety, construct piety, even impose piety on, on others. But I, for me, the piety that comes through the month of Ramadan is the, is the courage to say no. Because when you look at fasting, and, and if somebody is going to ask you, what do you do when you fast? A very simplistic question like this, what do Muslims do when they fast? The answer is you don't do anything. But it's a list of not doing that you impose upon yourself in this month. Mm -hmm. So fasting is more about not doing, not eating from this time to this time, not drinking from this time to this, refraining intimacy from this time to this time, all those, the list of not doing. So 
I think what happens here in the form of spiritual growth is sort of exercising on the self what it means to refrain and hence generate this, to be empowered by piety. And if I can say no to things that I'm so habituated to, getting up and having my cup of coffee or my cup of tea, this is my habit. To say no for something that is higher, then how about as as a citizen of a country where I can come out and say, no, I, I don't like this about our community. I don't want this about our global community. I don't like to see this kind of oppression. And I want to say no to these forms of injustices. So I think there is that connect of that spiritual piety, sort of empowering the citizen to say no to oppression and systems of injustice. And and they are to some form related. At least I wanna believe that. and, And I wanna take that going forward. Yes, empowered by piety. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, Majaveen. What a thought to leave us with because we are at our time. Yeah. May, yes. may it be so. Yeah, may it be so. And, and uh, thank you for joining me, Dina. And thank you for uh, everyone who joined us and who chimed in uh, in the chat and um, for your encouragement, for your questions, for your presence. We thank you all. We thank the Walter and Elise uh, Haas Fund for enabling and uh, giving us uh, the support to carry on with these conversations and these programs. And we leave with a prayer and hopefully a practice of peace and justice for everyone and security and well-being for everyone that is, um, that is out there and intentionally engaging in activities spiritually and otherwise to be able to bring that world um, of comfort and healing for all. Thank you.